Forensic Biology Screening Workshop, Saliva. Saliva is a colorless fluid secreted by three glands in the mouth, the sublingual, submandibular, and parotid glands. Saliva from parotid glands contain amylases, which are enzymes which aid in the digestion of carbohydrates. Saliva is composed of electrolytes, enzymes, and mucus. Screening for saliva is based on detection of high levels of amylase in the sample. It is not a confirmatory test because amylase is found in other body fluids, such as serum, urine, sweat, lip mucus, semen, and feces. The concentration of amylase in saliva is variable among individuals. If amylase is not detected in a sample, it does not mean that saliva is not present. UV light can be used to aid in locating saliva stains. The intensity of the fluorescence can be affected by the substrate, concentration of the stain, and other body fluids. Saliva does not fluoresce as intensely as semen. Humans have both pancreatic and salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is a hydrolytic enzyme. Salivary amylase is also referred to as tylen. Alpha amylase is found in humans, elephants, rats, and pigs. It cleaves starch at its internal bonds. It acts on the alpha-1,4 glucosidic linkages. This allows for compound hydrolysis, the total breakdown of starch to maltose or glucose and dextrin. Beta amylase is found in plants. It cleaves only the alpha-1,4 glycosidic links. Therefore, it can't cleave starch at its internal bonds, so there is an incomplete starch breakdown, only to maltose. One of the earliest tests for amylase was the starch iodine test. Iodine solutions cause starch to turn a deep blue color. Amylase is a starch hydrolyzing enzyme. The presence of amylase causes the disappearance of the blue color due to the hydrolysis of the starch and can be used as an indicator for the presence of amylase. Both alpha and beta amylase react with the starch iodine test. Beta amylase results in a hazy cloudy clearing due to the partial breakdown of starch. Alpha amylase has a full clearing due to the complete breakdown of the starch. Limitations of amylase testing. It is not confirmatory. It is not specific for human amylase. It is specific for alpha amylase but alpha amylase can be found in other species. For the starch iodine radial diffusion test, the phosphate buffer with a pH of 6.9 is prepared by adding 2.7 grams of sodium dihydrogen phosphate to 3.9 grams of disodium hydrogen phosphate, 0.2 grams of sodium chloride, and these are all dissolved in 500 milliliters of distilled water. The iodine development solution is prepared by adding 1.65 grams of potassium iodide to 2.54 grams of iodine, and this is added to distilled water, 30 milliliters. It is dissolved by stirring for five minutes at 65 degrees Celsius in a fume hood. Then store the saturated iodine solution in a dark stoppered bottle. The working solution is in one to 50 dilution with distilled water. The gel test plates are made up of 2% agarose and 0.1% soluble starch. They are made up by combining phosphate buffer at a pH of 6.9, 10 milliliters of that, agarose 0.2 grams of that, and soluble starch 0.01 grams. These are heated to boiling and you continue stirring constantly until all the agarose is dissolved. Then divide the gel solution and pour into three 2-inch disposable plastic petri dishes and allow to polymerize completely. Then store the gels inverted at 4 degrees Celsius. This is done to retard dehydration. To perform the starch iodine radial diffusion test, extract a small piece of stained material with 50 microliters of distilled water. Run at least one positive control consisting of a known dilution of fresh liquid saliva, 1 to 500 in distilled water and a negative control consisting of just distilled water. Some laboratories add a second positive control consisting of a 1 to 100 dilution of fresh saliva. Punch holes in the gel plate with a vacuum pipette, leaving 1.5 centimeters between the sample wells. Place samples to be tested in the sample wells using a pipette. Each well holds approximately 4 microliters of liquid. 
Cover the Petri dish and place in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 6 hours or overnight. Stain the plate by pouring a 1 to 50 dilution of saturated iodine solution onto the surface. Then rinse with distilled water. Clear circles around the wells indicate areas of amylase activity. The diameter of the clear circle is proportional to the square root of the concentration of amylase. Record the diameter and results in notes. A positive test is one in which the ring size is equal or greater in size than the positive control. Some laboratories assess the level if more than one positive control is run. An inconclusive result is one in which the ring size is less than the positive control but greater than the negative control, and a negative result is an absence of any clear ring. Here is a short video showing the amylase diffusion method. The radial gel diffusion test, also known as the amylase diffusion test, is a preliminary screening test used to aid in the identification of saliva stains. After putting on appropriate protective gear, the analyst begins by punching holes in the gel plate with a vacuum pipette. The plate is then turned over and each hole is labeled according to what sample will be placed there. Samples are added to the appropriate wells. A 1 to 500 dilution of saliva and distilled water is used as a positive control. Distilled water is used for the negative control. The gel plate is placed in a 37 degree incubator for 6 hours or overnight. After removing the plate from the incubator, a dilution of saturated iodine solution is poured over the plate. and then rinsed off with distilled water. Clear circles around the wells indicate areas of amylase activity. A positive test is one in which the ring size is equal or greater in size than the positive control. An inconclusive result is one in which the ring size is less than the positive control, but greater than the negative control. A negative result is given by the absence of any clear ring. The Fatibus test is another test that is used to measure amylase. It is commercially available and it is a blue starch polymer. The blue dye is covalently attached to the starch and upon hydrolysis a product is obtained which is colorimetrically evaluated. For the Fatibus test, you need the Fatibus tablets which are commercially available, 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide which is also commercially available, and to perform the test, simply follow the instructions on the product insert. To perform the test, place a small piece of the sample material in a 10 by 75 test tube. In a second tube, place an equal sized piece of known saliva stain as a positive control. In a third tube, add no sample, that's your negative control. Add one milliliter of distilled water and a quart of a Fatibus tablet to each tube using clean forceps. Vortex to mix thoroughly. Then, incubate at 37 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Add 0.25 milliliters of 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide to each tube to stop the reaction. Centrifuge for 5 minutes. A transparent dark blue supernatant of equal or greater intensity than the positive control is regarded as a positive test for amylase activity. A blue color that is less intense than the positive control but darker than the negative control is considered inconclusive for the presence of amylase, and no blue color is considered negative for the presence of amylase. This shows what you would expect to see after the Fatibus test is completed. The two tubes on the right both show a positive result. The tube on the left, which is clear, shows a negative result. Here is a short video showing how to perform the Fatibus test. The Fatibus test is a preliminary screening test to aid in the identification of saliva. After putting on appropriate protective gear, the analyst places a small piece of the sample material in a test tube. In a second test tube, a piece of known saliva stain, the same size as the sample, is used as a positive control. A third tube, with no sample added, is used as a negative control. Next, one milliliter of water is added to each test tube and a quarter of a Fatibus tablet is added to each test tube. The test tubes are then vortexed and placed into an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. After the tubes are taken out of the incubator, sodium hydroxide is added to each tube to stop the reaction. The tubes are now centrifuged for five minutes. 
After five minutes, the tubes are removed and examined. If the sample tube has a transparent dark blue supernatant of equal or greater intensity than the positive control, it is regarded as a positive for amylase activity and indicates the presence of saliva. A negative test will show no blue color. For amylase mapping, use one Fatibus tablet per five milliliters of distilled water. 10 tablets per 50 milliliters of distilled water for a piece of 46 by 57 centimeter Wattman 1 filter paper. Crush the tablets using a mortar and pestle. Mix the Fatibus tablets with distilled water and put in a sprayer. Note that since the Fatibus mixture is actually a suspension, it must be kept mixed during spraying to evenly distribute the Fatibus particles. Hang or lay flat in a fume hood the pieces of filter paper to be sprayed. Use gloves and masks to prepare the papers. Spray the mist evenly onto the paper. Avoid spraying too heavy so that it does not run down the paper. Approximately 10 milliliters per 900 cm squared gives a suitable covering. The paper can be used immediately or can be used dry. If the papers are made up ahead of time, they should be stored in a dark, dry place. If the paper is used right away, there is no need to re-wet the paper. If the paper is dry, then re-spray the paper with distilled water until it is damp. However, be careful when re-wetting. If the paper is sprayed too much or too hard, the blue particles will puddle. The paper is then laid spotty side down on the item under examination and its position marked. A piece of plastic sheeting is laid over the filter paper and pressed for 40 to 60 minutes or 30 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius. Use of a flat board or sheet of glass on top of the sheeting can aid in this process. After incubation, the paper is removed and dried. Positive areas appear as blue zones in place of the mottled blue negative areas. Slight shrinkage of the filter paper may occur during drying. The paper, while still damp, can be sprayed with acid phosphatase mapping reagents to search for semen stains. The Salagé test is another test for the detection of amylase. The test is available from Abacus Diagnostics. It is sensitive, simple, and reported to be more accurate than other tests. It is a solution in a tube which changes color with the addition of an extract containing saliva. The exact mechanism is proprietary and its sensitivity is approximately 1 to 1,000 dilution. The Salagé test kit is commercially available and its storage instructions are on the product insert. To perform the test, place approximately a 5 mm square cutting or one half of a swab into a sterile 1.5 ml microcentrifuge tube. Place an equal sized piece of known saliva stain as a positive control in a separate sterile 1.5 ml microcentrifuge tube. In a third tube, add no sample. This is your negative control. Pipette 30 microliters to 50 microliters of sterile deionized water into the tube. Incubate for 30 minutes at room temperature. Allow the test vials to warm to room temperature, then remove bubbles from the test vials by gently tapping the vials. Add 8 microliters of the sample to the test vial and mix gently. The result is red after 10 minutes. A yellow color change indicates a positive result. No color change indicates a negative result. A negative result indicates that there is no saliva present or is below the limit of detection of the test. This picture shows the results of a Salagé test. The four vials on the right all show positive results and the vial on the left is what a negative result would look like. Now here is a video showing how to perform the Salagé test. The Salagé test is used to determine the possible presence of trace levels of saliva. After putting on appropriate protective gear, the analyst takes a small cutting of a swab and places it into a microcentrifuge tube. Next, sterile deionized water is pipetted into the tube which is then incubated for 30 minutes at room temperature. After allowing the test files to reach room temperature, it is necessary to remove any bubbles that might have formed by gently tapping on the side of the tube. Then, 8 microliters of the sample are added to the tube and gently mixed. After 10 minutes, the color of the liquid is checked. A yellow color change indicates a positive result. No color change indicates that there is no saliva present. Another test for saliva is the Rapid Stain Identification, RSID, of saliva. 
In the S area of the strip, there is anti-human salivary amylase, mobile monoclonal antibody conjugated with colloidal gold. If human salivary amylase is present in the sample, a mobile antibody antigen complex is formed and travels to the T area. In the T area, there is anti-human salivary amylase stationary monoclonal antibody. Stationary antibodies in the T area catch the mobile antigen antibody complex and this forms an antibody-antigen antibody complex. When the antibodies aggregate, a red line is formed. In the C area, there is an internal control. In the C area, you bind mouse antibodies with anti-mouse IgG, which ensures that the fluid transported the length of the strip and the test is working properly. To perform the test, place a small cutting of the stain into a 1.5 milliliter microcentrifuge tube. Add 200 to 300 microliters of RSID extraction buffer. Then incubate for 1 to 2 hours at room temperature. Remove 20 microliters of the extracted sample and add it to 80 microliters of RSID TBS running buffer in a new tube. Then add the total 100 microliters to the sample well of the RSID card. Read the results after 10 minutes. For a positive result, you should see the test line and the control line. For a negative result, only the control line will be present. An invalid result is indicated by no line at all or only the test line is present and no control line is seen. False positives with the test occurred with breast milk, fecal material and vaginal fluid. False negatives occurred due to the high dose hook effect. A sample containing up to 50 microliters of saliva did not result in a high dose hook effect. However, if a high dose hook effect is possible, Dilute using 1 to 100 dilution of the sample.